Hi, uh, my name is Damodaran. Uh, I'm an engineer with eBay and I work uh, mostly on seller and buyer focused experiences for eBay and all things web. Uh, I work predominantly on JavaScript. And uh, yeah, I'd like to also say my thanks for uh, uh, the organizers of this uh, conference for, for picking my uh, talk when I submitted it. And yeah, let's just get started maybe. So the topic for today was nuances and pitfalls in building scalable header platforms for e-commerce websites. So the first thing that, I mean, I normally get from people is what, what header, what is that? I mean, like, uh, is that so complex, right? Uh, so headers are the first widgets that show up on, on any given page. Like say, for example, if, if you are now talking about e-commerce websites, say for example, like eBay, um, you, the snapshot that you see here is an example of the header widget that shows up on MWeb, on apps and on DWeb and so on. So like what is so complex about it, right? Just a text box, like a couple of buttons and so on. But at first glance, uh, that's what it might look like. But uh, when you take a deeper look, like it, it actually brings in a lot of functionality. Um, the first and foremost thing is that you, your uh, platform users would not be able to sign in and sign out. If this thing is not going to show up, they would not be able to do their uh, searches on the site if it doesn't show up. And uh, all those quick links and the important links that actually have all those core functionalities hidden inside your website. Say, for example, if you're an e-commerce website and you want users to buy and sell, all those quick links that are there would not show up if the header doesn't show up. And again, all your site navigation for the entire site, if they want to be uh, accessing the site through uh, specific categories, uh, that would not be possible again if the header did not show up. And again, things like uh, your profile pages, your, uh, your account settings pages, your uh, site-wide settings. Say, for example, you want to set a specific uh, shipping provider or you want to set a specific currency or you want to set a specific language. Those things would not be available again. You would not be able to view your watch list, uh, see your notifications, access your shopping cart, all of that. So at first glance, it might look very simple. But uh, when you take a closer look, you really understand like, uh, how much of core functionality this one small part of the page actually encompasses uh, fully. And uh, when we talk of uh, header platforms, we basically talk of uh, the entire uh, project of the header that is maintained by uh, specific teams that run these projects. And uh, in, in, in the talk today, we'll just see like how eBay went about scaling this and uh, just building this. So when we talk of header components, right, there are uh, visual components. I mean, the ones that users can actually click access, I mean, interact with and so on. The snapshots that you see on the screen right now. But there are also a lot of non-visual components because uh, the header platform is something that is like uh, cross-functional and is going to be horizontal and present across all pages. So it also serves as a mechanism for you to be able to send stuff across all your pages in the website. Say, for example, you want to send a specific script that has to load across pages, right? Then the header platform is a good candidate for actually serving that. Um, so what exactly happens is these uh, non-visual components are things like service workers, things like uh, HTTP clients, service clients, uh, those scripts that would help you manipulate cookies and uh, all other partner platform integrations. Like say, for example, when you're talking of a, a website of eBay scale, right? There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. Like if you, if you just scaffold an app, um, the first thing you would have to deal with is tracking, experimentation, rate limiter, and all of these things. So you don't really want your app to be integrating with every single of these platforms that are there within eBay. Instead, you give this responsibility to the header platform and that takes care of one single horizontal function that is present across all pages. And uh, it takes care of doing all these kind of interactions and, and integrations behind the scenes. And those are the non-visual components that we're talking about. So when we are actually going about uh, formulating an architecture for this kind of a setup, right? we also have to take into account the scale that we are operating. So for example, if you take a look at uh, eBay, for instance, there's over like 600 plus uh, apps on production right now, at least front end apps. And there's like over a hundred uh, teams that are actually maintaining all these apps. They are on multiple stacks and frameworks. And uh, there's like so many different uh, partner platforms that you'll have to integrate with. And since the header is present across all pages, right? At the time of peak traffic, it can clock close to a billion impressions in traffic. And uh, the most important part there is that since it's the first widget that shows up on the screen and it's above the fold, you just have a window of 25 to 30 milliseconds to operate. 
uh, so your header has to show up within that amount of time for uh, uh, for actually improving perceived performance so having all these in mind right we have to actually take care of a lot of things when we design this kind of a system um, the first thing is that uh, the availability of the system you don't want the header to go down because that's the, that it, it it actually brings in the most crucial functionality as we saw earlier and you would uh, absolutely have it to have at least uh, a zero downtime or uh, the usual scale of 99.999 and uh, i mean obviously you need to have uh, a good amount of fault tolerance uh, if there are any errors you don't want the system to just uh, go boom on the screen and you obviously you would want to show some sort of a, a fallback there and uh, you also want something like isolation from failures. Uh, you don't want any errors from the domain teams to, to creep into the header or, or the other way around. And uh, you want these teams to be operating independently. So you, you're talking about a scale where there's like, like over 100 different teams that manage so many different apps in production. And they have their own uh, release cycles. And you don't want your release cycles to be uh, sort of tied with them and so on. So they have to be independent. And in the event there is any error, uh, you would want the uh, the recovery time to be very minimal. And as usual, we need to have a fast response time of about 20 to 30 milliseconds. And we obviously know the scale of traffic we're dealing with. And uh, we also need to take care of all the other things like uh, tracking, experimentation, testing, uh, being able to debug if there are issues. And uh, we also need this to be front-end framework agnostic because when you talk of so many different teams, right, you have so many different uh, I mean, engineers who have their own opinions and they have their own frameworks they like. There are people who work on React. There are people who work on something called Marco, which is like actually open source by eBay. And uh, that there are people who are working on Angular and so on. So you would want your uh, app to be uh, framework agnostic and not be tied to all these things, which are, I mean, all these choices made by uh, the engineers of the domain pages. And obviously, you would also have to account for personalization, which uh, and and we'll just get to that in a moment. Uh, even before we start, right? I just wanted to go over the structure of a generic eBay app. So eBay operates in a, uh, the usual microservice architecture, and it makes use of Process Manager 2, wherein every box in production would have about one uh, master process followed by three worker processes. And uh, eBay believes in general about MPAs, which are multi-page apps. They are not heavy into single page applications because of the various performance implications and SEO implications associated with uh, single page apps. Um, so the apps are mostly multi-page applications. And uh, this is the usual structure of an app in uh, eBay. And uh, we are like heavily invested into Node.js. There are, of course, some apps that are very old that are still on the Java stack. But all the new apps that are th uh, I mean, are getting built are again on the Node.js stack, and this is how the stack would would pretty much look like. So when a request comes into like one of these servers, it would go through a, a set of pipeline handlers, and these handlers uh, they actually set the eBay context. They do a lot of these calls behind the scenes, like the tracking calls, the authentication calls, authorization calls, fetching app secrets, tokens, all of that. And and at the end of it all, right, the request comes to your app code. And at this point, you want to be able to render the header. So what we do is we we first uh, send the call for the header render, I mean, well ahead of the pipeline, so that the call is, is actually resolved at the time it comes to the app code. So that is the first thing we do. And uh, we also have, as usual, NPM modules, because we're using a Node.js-based architecture. We do have our own, uh, I mean, the header NPM adapter module. and. Uh, We'll see how that uh, factors into the entire architecture quite soon. And the, I mean, the next thing we want to talk about is render speed. As I mentioned earlier, eBay is mostly into MPAs, which are multi-page applications. And the bare minimum criteria for any framework that is there inside eBay is for it to be able to do server-side rendering. It should also be able to stream responses, and it should be able to do something called async rendering, wherein you, in this example, right, you see this. Uh, I mean, this image on the left side, which waits for all the services to complete, and then it loads the page. Whereas the image on the right side um, is an example where as the services finish and respond, you are going to just render that fragment of the template and flush it to the browser. So you see an improvement in terms of uh, perceived performance, wherein on the left side, there's nothing on the screen. It just waits for everything to load, whereas the one on the right side, it starts loading stuff immediately. 
and you want the header to load in such a way so that it is able to show up itself in about 25 to 30 milliseconds immediately. The next thing is that we were talking about scale uh, and we also need to have the header absolutely available. So the earlier uh, screens I spoke about uh, the headers having visual and non-visual components and uh, now the visual components can be further uh, split into static fragments and dynamic fragments. So um, the thing here is that static fragments are the ones that show up uh, are pretty much common to almost a large segment of users, whereas dynamic fragments are very personalized data. Say, for example, your shopping cart is going to have a different set of items from what I might have in my shopping cart and so on. So um, the, the important thing is that you would be able to access dynamic fragments only when you're able to have the static fragments show up. So only if I have this, the static header to show up, I would be able to hover over the, say, the cart icon to be able to see my uh, all the items in the shopping cart and so on. So uh, this kind of uh, a diff is actually driven by the UI and the UX itself. And this actually factors a lot into the kind of architecture we go for this. Um, so how do we go about scaling the static portions? Right? That's one thing. So the, the thing is that if, if you're able to generalize the header, but still be able to differentiate it based on some specific aspects, then you would be able to serve the same kind of header for millions of users belonging to that specific segment. So when we talk about aspects here, what we are talking about is, say, for example, eBay has a US site and a UK site. Uh, they do have different pages like uh, the search page, home page, the, the item pages, the product pages, and so on. They do have different variants. They have to serve the header on Mweb. They also have to serve it on Dweb. Uh, eBay also has its own uh, design system, uh, which is operated by a, a framework called Skin. And uh, you would, I mean, since there are so many pages and only a handful amount of teams that are available to operate it, you'd obviously see that uh, some pages are on an older version of design systems and some are on, an, uh, are on the latest version of the design system. So you would not want to serve the header, I mean, the latest header onto a page that is having a very old design system. They don't blend homogeneously and would just stand out and it would look very awkward. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing is that we also have different flavors of the header. You, we have the simple flavor, which is the one that you see on the right side, and the prominent one, which is called the full flavor, which you see on the left side with the prominent search box. The thing is that when you're on the search page, the search functionality is the most prominent thing that has to show up. But if you're on the shopping cart page, right, the 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 goal or the intent is for for that uh, transaction to be converted completely. You don't want to distract the user by showing up a prominent search box there and and again, wanting them to search. So so based on these aspects, right, the site, the pages, the variants, the, the, the version of the design system themes and uh, things like the, the header flavors and the languages, we would be able to formulate a key from these aspects. And uh, if you're able to compute a response for this specific key, and since this key is going to be pretty much common for a large number of users in a specific segment, say, for example, the eBay US site homepage, which is on the language English and is, is following a specific version of a design system on MWeb, right? That is a specific static header that is going to be served for millions of users. So if you are able to compute this before and you're able to cache it, you would be able to repurpose the same header for millions of users. That's pretty much the idea. And uh, like we were also talking about design considerations with isolation and, and independence. So uh, the need for isolation is that you don't want errors from each of the header and the domain pages to, to affect the other one. And in terms of independence, we don't want uh, the release cycles to be tied up and we want all the engineers of different teams to be able to operate independently so that we are able to ro uh, roll out code with, with good velocity. And uh, the other ones is that we want the header teams and the domain teams to be able to conduct their own A-B tests and experiments. And uh, so the, the thing is that since we are actually operating in a Node.js based environment, the obvious thing, the first thing is the header NPM module. But the catch here is that this, uh, I mean, this NPM module is not going to do the render. It's just going to make downstream service calls. As I earlier established, right, the first uh, a bare minimum criteria is that we expect all the front end frameworks to be able to do server side rendering and we are operating in a multi-page environment. And uh, the thing is that the only things that these uh, modules do is that they make service calls if they don't already have a response. And uh, the only things they expose to the, the pages, say for example, the home page or the search page and so on, 
would be tag libraries. And these can be on any different frameworks. You could be on Svelte, you could be on SolidJS, you could be on React, you could be on Marco, and we would just uh, have those uh, tag libraries for those specific frameworks exposed. And uh, these domain pages here, which we call as the various pages within eBay, the home page, search page, and all, they don't have to bother about uh, the render of the HTML, and they don't have to bother about bundling resources because all of that is now taken care of by the render service, which actually performs the rendering. We'll just get to that in a moment. So uh, as I earlier mentioned, right, we just have a window of about 25 to 30 milliseconds for the header to show up. And uh, the thing is that this can obviously only be accomplished by some form of heavy caching. And we are able to cache this because we already are going to split the visual components, as I earlier mentioned, into static and dynamic fragments. And the static fragments are something that can be served to millions of users belonging to a specific segment. So if we cache that, we are obviously doing good in terms of uh, the render speed. So the first thing here is that, uh, I mean, when a request comes in into an eBay app and it's it's going to see the header NPM module, the header NPM module is going to have these tag libraries exposed and it's, it, it's going to attempt to render, which means it's going to make a service call. But even before making the service call, it's going to look up into a system of caches. Uh, like we have a cache that is tied to every single process in production, which means you would have three different caches in production, which is the L1 cache, and we do have a shared cache behind the scenes. So if it's present in the cache that is uh, tied to a specific process, it would flush that immediately. If not, it would look up into the backup cache and repopulate the main cache and flash it back. And uh, the last thing is, if it's not present in any of these caches, it is going to obviously make a service call to the renderer service, which is going to perform the render and return the rendered HTML back to us. Uh, so through this uh, system of caching, right, we are able to serve the header in less than 30 milliseconds. And the reason why we cannot go, we, we actually maintain this cache within the, the NPM module here, but we don't have a distributed cache because Again, that introduces a new network call, and there is, again, a network latency involved, and there is, again, some form of uncertainty that's actually tied to that call. If the call fails, if the render fails, and so on. Uh, so for that purpose, we don't really uh, have this option of, of going to a distributed cache or a shared caching server and, and things like that. We would have to have the cache local, that is, to every single box within, uh, I mean, every single domain page. and. Uh, yeah, that is pretty much about caching here. And as I mentioned, right, since we have this last option of making uh, the network call here for actually doing the render, what happens is we are introducing some form of network latency and we have some form of uncertainty there. So a lot of things can go wrong. The render can fail, the service call can fail, and so on. And sometimes even the Node.js worker processes restarts if there are any errors, like uh, if they are out of memory errors and so on. So we do have the last backup cache, which is a disk-based cold cache that is, uh, uh, I mean, bootstrapped into memory. Uh, so in case the worker restarts, uh, it is going to be able to go back to this cold cache and pull it up and immediately serve the header so that there is like a near zero downtime for the header. And I was also mentioning earlier that we are able to split these visual components into static and dynamic fragments. And static fragments are entirely static. And then the dynamic fragments have a very uh, specific user personalized data. But that is not entirely true. Uh, because uh, even the static fragments have some hints of personalization. Say, for example, you log in and you need to see a greeting message like this. On the, I mean, I'm just referring to the image on the right side here. So. Um, we do have a hint of personalization there. And uh, so what we do is uh, just before the HTML is going to be flushed out to the browser, we would just do an injection of uh, specific uh, user values like this, uh, I mean, into the response so that it shows up on the screen immediately. And uh, the other one, I mean, the last part of the setup is, again, the renderer service. The renderer service is the one that actually performs the HTML rendering on the server. And uh, again, it also has uh, a two-tier caching system for uh, faster responses. And this cache can obviously be, uh, be a distributed cache because it's not accessed pretty often. But we haven't actually found a need for that yet. And we are able to uh, serve this without a, a cache that is actually distributed. Uh, the thing specific about this renderer service is that it is framework agnostic, which means your uh, domain page, which is like the home page, the search page, or the cart page, the checkout page, or anything. It can be on any sort of a view library, and they don't really have to bother. Nor does the header team have to bother what is being used by the domain pages. 
because the entire uh, render is going to be decoupled away from the domain pages and they can be on any view library they want and we can be on any sort of a view library that we want um, the only uh, thing here is that uh, the only point of interface here again is is just the adapter and uh, if you are making any changes to the uh, the adapter we ensure that it's uh, it's actually included as part of the monthly software updates which are automated and so if a team actually onboards into the software upgrade they would just get the latest version of the specific adapter that they require so when we talk of this renderer service right there's like two problems that can happen so if you just think of the case when uh, you're on the home page uh, and you have about x boxes on the home page pool that is trying to serve the header and a specific variant of the header say for example the the x boxes are trying to serve y requests uh, for the header and uh, it's not present in the cache and so it tries to make requests to the downstream service which is the renderer service and the renderer service can obviously get uh, a lot of calls in that fashion right so uh, there is no point if you are trying to process all these requests at the same time because they are all uh, a similar requests that just happen to occur uh, uh, simultaneously so uh, we don't want to overstress the downstream server by processing all of these uh, these requests instead we just process only one out of the n requests and and we we just repurpose the same response for the remaining n minus 1 request they call this as request collapsing that is like uh, it solves a very specific uh, problem in distributed systems uh, in in terms of uh, handling cascading failures uh, that is one thing that we use for this and that is actually employed uh, using the hystrix uh, library that was popularized by netflix and uh, we use that through a library called truba and uh, that helps you build uh, scalable pipelines for uh, for large scale apps of this size um so we are able to hold those requests and we just process one out of the end requests and we repurpose the same response for the remaining n minus 1 requests again these are actually computed based on the aspects so we know that the the end requests are similar because we, we are able to actually compute the key for the aspects and we know that all these requests are pretty similar so we don't have to process them the next one is we do have circuit breakers in place i think there was a session about circuit breakers uh, in this conference and we also pretty much use circuit breakers because uh, when a downstream system is already strained uh, you don't want to fire more and more calls and don't give that an opportunity to recover from the error right so uh, that is like a bad pattern so it helps to sort of alleviate back pressure on downstream servers and also prevent cascading failures and it helps to lower the stress on downstream systems so what what basically happens is the uh, the app monitor would monitor the downstream service for markdowns if it sees a markdown and if uh, it'll just open the circuit and not make the service call instead it'll 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 just uh, trigger the trap for serving the fallbacks immediately so that uh, there uh, there's no delay in the response and at the same time behind the scenes it keeps monitoring for this the status of the service by making things at regular intervals and seeing if the service comes back up if it comes back up then it again closes the circuit and it it just continues making the calls so we talked about static fragments of the header so far and uh, let's now uh, have a look at how the dynamic portions are so the dynamic portions pretty much follow the established patterns of uh, of building any sort of a distributed system um at least it is it's held heavily in place by ebay's infrastructure that includes by default the hystrix patterns and and all the request collapses that we earlier discussed before there is also um, so what basically happens is the the static header loads on the page and then the users just can act. say for example if i'm going to click on uh, the watch list here it has to show up a model or a flyout with all the items there and for that it would just make an ajax call to the downstream service and uh, that would reach a separate production pool and that's like also one of the reasons why we split this into static and dynamic fragments because we now have two different production pools and we are able to scale these independently so the static fragments can be scaled independently and the dynamic fragments can be scaled independently and uh, the errors that occur in one don't impact the other and so on and uh, it also makes the static header extremely resilient because uh, it has to absolutely show up even for the dynamic portions to work so if you're going to access say for example your uh, your notifications you just hover over the bell icon there on ebay's website it would show up a list of notifications for that we make an ajax call that reaches the dynamic uh, header uh, 
I mean platform, which takes care of the HTML rendering on the server. Internally, it makes downstream service calls, uh, which are again, uh, it again follows the backend for frontend approach here. And uh, these things can again involve, uh, I mean, layers of caching and, uh, and DB sharding and so on. eBay has its uh, servers in three different infrastructures uh, that are held in at uh, three different places. So uh, in terms of coordinating with them and all that, all the usual established patterns of distributed systems come into play here. And uh, yeah, putting it together, we have a separate uh, pool for the static portions and uh, and also a separate pool for the uh, I mean for the dynamic fragments. We are able to scale them independently, and uh, the errors in one don't impact the other, making them more uh, resilient. And uh, for instance, the entire set of one billion impressions that were clocked at the the time of high speed traffic for the static fragments were just served using 40 boxes on production because uh, we rely heavily on caching again and we are able to uh, i mean uh, cache that in a manner that i earlier discussed before and so the entire set of 1 billion impressions get served with about 40 boxes in production and the dynamic uh, i mean portions they are frequently uh, accessed and have to be recomputed for every single user so we have about uh, 500 boxes that serve this in production and this is handled again by eBay's own cloud infrastructure. They don't use, uh, I mean, Azure or AWS or anything like that. They have their own uh, cloud platform that can flex up and flex on based on the traffic. The last part of this is like uh, being able to debug entries. We uh, earlier saw that there was a multi-tier caching system like this in place. And so we obviously need to know which, uh, I mean, which part of this uh, system actually ended up serving the request. So if we are having any issues, we need to be able to debug that specifically. And those sort of, a, I mean, a setup is already in place. And we are also able to bypass the cache completely to load and test a fully cacheless experience. In terms of testing, there are end-to-end -end pipelines that we have, I mean, automation pipelines that are written that, uh, that obviously will do, uh, I mean, testing for uh, at random times for uh, the most important pages at least for eBay to ensure that the header always shows up. And in terms of tracking also, we do have, uh, I mean, impression tracking for every single page that loads up, did the header load up or not, and things like that. And uh, for observability and monitoring, we do monitor uh, the CPU usage of the production servers, and we also check for out of memory errors and error counts. And uh, if, if there are any, uh, I mean, issues that happening, it would immediately start, uh, uh, I mean, all the alarm bells would start going on. And uh, the last bit of this is, uh, I mean, we are tracking so much on the server and we obviously need to know, also know that did the header, I mean, after showing up on the page, did the header actually work properly, right? So for this, we log again, uh, the client side errors back into Cal, which is eBay's, uh, they call this as the central application logger. And from that, we are able to pull in uh, data if, the, if we had any uh, sort of errors on the client side when the, the header loaded. And lastly, uh, this cache eviction, right? So we have established that there are independent pools. I mean, every page is on a separate pool within eBay. And uh, so if they do rollouts, it's going to reset the cache because it's an in-memory cache and that's fine. Um, but what happens if the renderer service does a rollout, right? Then what happens? Uh, so this is handled by, uh, I mean, eBay's config management team that is, that's actually going to publish a config which any apps that are interested is going to listen to. And once they uh, subscribe for that specific change, they would do something called staggered cache eviction uh, so that they don't flood the downstream service again. I mean, just uh, trying to evict all the cache entries and repopulating all of them again. Um, yeah, that is pretty much it. So the, the, the important takeaway here was uh, sometimes it's not about just designing a distributed system, right? You have sometimes the UI and the UX con I mean, can also drive your design decisions. In this case, we were able to split that into two segments separately, and we, we were able to uh, sort of isolate them away and scale them uh, in a manner that they don't impact each other. So that was a big takeaway in this. And I've included all the references that uh, I've shared for this session that I've spoke about in this uh, talk, and uh, you can always refer to that. I'm hoping there'll be access to the slides sometimes. Yeah, that is pretty much it. Simon?